if you know someone that has questions or struggles with the Trinity, the Godhead, maybe you yourself have often wondered, well, where exactly is this taught in Scripture? How do I, how do I figure out what this triune God is? And you want to hop on the phone, I'll even give you a special dispensation, provided you pull off the road to text somebody and tell them to tune in to AM 1100 KFAX or log on right now, no matter where they're at in the world, at kfax.com, because we're going to break down some serious answers right out of God's Word, presenting biblical propositions supporting the Trinity. And joining me tonight in studio is a familiar voice to KFAX listeners. Also, I might add, a very dear friend. He serves as an adjunct professor at Golden Gate Theological Seminary. He is a pastor of a Tiburon Christian Church up in the North Bay and is host of Contending for the Faith, third Saturday evenings at 7 p.m. right here on KFAX. He is Dr. Jerry Buckner, and Dr. Buckner, is always great to see you. Craig, it's always a blessing to be in the studio live, and uh, oftentimes you generally interview me by phone. And so I said, I better make a commitment to come in here so I can show a sense of humility. <laughs> <laughs> Humble thyself. <laughs> after, after all, you know, I uh, gave uh, birth from uh, your program to our program. And so we thank the Lord for you and the way God has used you throughout the years and standing firm for the word and the love of people. So we appreciate you and your program as well. Well, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come on in and uh uh, spend some time going deep in God's words today, which is so critically important, you know, a, kind of as a foundation to our, our topic and our conversation. A lot of Christians have a very peripheral knowledge of their faith. Some even struggle with the ability to explain their faith to someone else. And no surprise that there's such a small margin of believers today that could even tell you that they've ever shared their faith, let alone led someone to Christ, because largely we we really don't know what it is we believe or why we believe it. And so with that thought in mind, laying a stronger foundation, going deeper in God's Word, and one of the key things that you do every Saturday evening at 7 on Contending for the Faith is teaching people the importance of embracing, understanding the very fundamentals, the very pillars of our faith. And tonight we discuss one that I think is, is so key and yet is um, so clouded in the minds of so many, and that is the topic of the Trinity. First, tell me, if you would, Dr. Buckner, how this came to the attention of you, that you would even write a book uh, of feeling that strong about this topic. That's a good uh, question, Craig, and I think the thing that has really put a burden on my heart regarding doing a book on this subject is because I have uh, traveled all over the the, the world pretty much and doing lectures for uh, various uh, denominations and organizations and and in the midst of doing uh, seminars and workshops uh, I found that a lot of Christians including even pastors uh, are really ignorant when it comes to the essential doctrines of the historic Christian faith. And I've been to pastor's breakfasts, and I have uh, done uh, this workshop uh, on the Trinity to them. And uh, to my surprise, they didn't know. And I figure, so if the pastors don't know, then their congregations definitely don't know. So um, I really have had a conviction by the Holy Spirit to do a book on the essential doctrines of the historic Christian faith. And I think that there are five that is really, that stands out, even though I didn't interject this in the book. And, and one is that we better know is uh, that Jesus is the only way. There's no way around that, that he's the only way. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And then the Trinity is another essential doctrine, and then the deity of Christ, that he truly is God and man. And then the other one is the vicarious atonement, that uh, the scriptures let us, uh, let us know very clearly that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And then the other one is the bodily resurrection, that Christ came back from the dead bodily, the Greek word for body is soma. And so those are the essential doctrines of the historic Christian faith right there in a nutshell. And because I've seen pastors not know this, especially the Trinity, I was convicted to do this. The curse of the church today is biblical illiteracy, and it parades itself in and out of the church. And, and
And as uh, Amos once said, you know, there is a famine in the land. And he spoke of it not only regarding starvation, but a famine regarding the Word of God. And it's really real today in our churches. I heard it said recently by a preacher that we've even seen this uh, trend taking place in the pulpits of America today, where we've seen this paradigm shift from thus saith the Lord to, well, in my opinion, and a lot of that gets us into trouble, particularly on a topic like this. And, and I, I, I want to take note, you referred to this as an essential doctrine. Help us understand that, because a lot of Christians at the periphery would say, well, we understand that, that Christianity, like Judaism, is a monotheistic religion. We get into the details about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden it gets a little bit murky. And oftentimes critics of this notion, like those within the Oneness Pentecostal movement, would say, well, wait a minute now, Dr. Buckner. We've gone through the entirety of the New Testament. Not once does the word Trinity appear in there. So how can we even believe that there's such a thing as the Trinity if the Bible doesn't specifically teach to this point? That's a very good question. And uh, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, the word itself, but the concept and the evidence is there. So this might be like the issue of abortion. We might say that abortion doesn't appear in the Bible either, and yet the concept of it in terms of it being against the law of God, taking of a life, and the value of life is certainly throughout Scripture. Very much so. And another two other words, it's not in the Bible, but the evidence and the concept is there, is the word rapture and also the word incarnation. So those are doctrines that we use all the time, and we use it theologically. But uh, the evidence is there. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses, I've been studying cults now for 40 years, and I consider myself an expert in the field of comparative religion and apologetics. And the Jehovah's Witnesses say, well, you shouldn't believe in the Trinity because the word is not there. But they use the word theocratic kingdom, and that's not in the Bible. So because the word is not there doesn't mean that the evidence and the validity of the concept is there. And I think it's very important for us to understand what we use the word essential. We're saying there is no compromise. There is no sellout. We have to believe that. Uh, St. Augustine one time said... In the essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. So there are some things like <clears throat> baptism. You know, people do various forms of baptism. Uh, the communion. Those are essential foundational uh, truths. But when it comes to these areas that we're talking about tonight, uh, people are going to do those non-essential <clears throat> teachings and doctrines differently. But when it comes to these subjects like the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the bodily resurrection, the atonement, there is no compromise. There's no getting around. And matter of fact, Jesus made it so clear. There are, I would say, 23 times in the Johannian gospel, that is the gospel of John that the word I am is used. And that is the divine title for Jesus. And so Jesus says in John 8 and 24, if you believe not that I am he, you will die in your sins. That's very clear. And Jesus was the one that spoke out of the burning bush back in the Old Testament in uh, Exodus 3 and 14. When Moses says, when I go before the children of Israel and they shall ask of me, what is your name? What shall I say? And then uh, God says to Moses in Hebrew, eh, yah, esher, eh, yah, I am that I am. And then Jesus comes along later on in John 8 and 58 and says, before Abraham was, I am. And then he goes as far as saying, if you believe not that I am he, you will die in your sins. So these are no compromise. And yet we see a lot of churches compromising it. And you have to question if those are genuine churches. There certainly is the idea that, uh, you know, now we see through a glass darkly, there are aspects perhaps maybe that go down to let he that has an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit of God is saying. And in this case, we're going to dive a little bit deeper because as you point out, Dr. Buckner, while there is not the, the clear-cut mention of the Trinity within the New Testament, there certainly is the concept of the revelation of same that we find not only in the Old Testament, but New Testament as well. And we'll dive through some of those specifics as we continue our conversation tonight. With us in studio, Dr. Jerry Buckner, host of Contending for the Faith, heard Saturday evenings at 7 p.m. right here on KFAX. He has a brand new book out called Biblical Propositions Supporting the Trinity. And we'll give you some details in a bit as to where you can obtain a copy for yourself. Meanwhile, if you want to jump in with a comment or a question, toll free throughout Northern California 
me at 888-367-5329. That's 888-F-O-R-K-F-A-X. A brief time out, an update on traffic. <clears throat> Pardon me, choking up over it. Back with more right after this. We're back to our conversation with us tonight in studio is the host of Contending for the Faith, Dr. Jerry Buckner. He, of course, is an adjunct professor at Golden Gate Theological Seminary. His broadcast Saturday evenings at 7 p.m. here on KFAX. We are tackling the topic of the Trinity on today's program. A critically important one, as Dr. Buckner outlined prior to the break, because it's one of the, the fundamental pillars of the faith, and yet one... Uh, Dr. Buckner, that, that is obscure in the minds of, of many people. There seems to be a degree of confusion over this, and yet, as you've been pointing out, if we just take the time to connect the dots, it really is is all there, isn't it? And not just in the New Testament alone, but even in the Old Testament. Yes, absolutely. You find it in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, where, you know, you don't have to be a great logician to figure out that the Bible is very clear that uh, God has been communicated and he communicated himself as being one God. Uh, I take a great um, commitment to uh, meditation and I think that meditation leads to memorization as, as always. But in the Old Testament, God is called one God, Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And then in the New Testament, he's called one God in First uh, Timothy 2 and 5. For there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And then you find also in James 2 and 19, thou believest that there is one God, you do well. The demons also believe and tremble. So it's very clear that God has communicated himself as one God, and yet that one God, is called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So three distinct persons, yet coexisting in unity, co-equal, co-eternal, and consubstantial. Exactly. I always put it this way, and I was mentored under Dr. Walter Martin, who started the Bible Answer Man program, and I had the privilege and opportunity to be blessed under his teaching. And he gave a definition that I don't think anybody else has really improved upon that. And let me give it to you. He says, within the nature of the one true God, there are three eternal, distinct persons who are called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they are co-equal, co-eternal, and co-existent. And the reason why we put distinction in there because of the fact that they are one in nature and essence, ontologically, but they are three distinct persons, just like a husband and a wife, uh, they in marriage become one, but yet they are distinct as well. So, But when you deal with uh, cultic organizations, even going back to, I would say, to the third century, you had an organization known, a guy by the name of Sibelius, and he basically taught that, there, that God manifested himself in different modes and that sort of thing. And then he taught from there modalism, and that basically taught that Jesus at one time appeared as the Father in history, the Son, and Holy Spirit, and there is no distinction. We heard a breakdown one time suggesting that the example of water, ice, and vapor, steam, all three identical in, in its composition is H2O, and yet in three distinctive forms. And that really more describes modalism, really doesn't have anything to do with helping us understand the Trinity. No, it doesn't. And uh, unless one says that there are three uh, elements, like uh, distinctive elements, and yet one substance. And identical which is, in nature in every case. Exactly. And so, so water can be a beautiful thing if we use it in that sense. But if we use it in the sense of the modalist, it becomes problematic. And today, the modalists today are people such as the Pentecostal oneness mm -hmm. movement. And they will go as far as saying from Isaiah 9 and 6 that unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government shall be up on his shoulders, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, mm -hmm. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. So I know you're going to bring that up a little bit later on. I can hit you're on down that road right all now. Right, take all it right. right. <laughs> all right. Well, the thing is, I've had people call in on the radio and say, well, 
if if the father is is called if if Jesus is called the father then does that not mean that he is actually the father well what we got to do is understand the jewish mind the bible is a jewish book and you have to look at the bible from the jewish mind and in the jewish mind the word father didn't always apply to always a father per se uh for instance, uh, Abigail means, uh, she means father of lights. Well, this is a woman. Mm-hmm. So in the Hebrew mind, her name meant father. Paul was actually looked at as a father to Timothy and to Titus, but he was not their literal father. So in the mind of the Jewish mind, a father means someone who actually relates to somebody even on a spiritual plane as well. So Isaiah 9 and 6, Jesus actually is the father of eternity in the sense that he possesses control of eternity. He is from all eternity. And so when it says father of eternity, it doesn't mean literally that he's the father uh, of that contradicts the father in the Bible. It just simply means that that's the way the Jewish mind communicated. This also perhaps helps us understand the concept as we see Christ talked about both prophetically in the Old Testament and revealed in the New Testament that he was not created but rather begotten of the Father. It's an important distinction, is it not? It really is. And the word begotten is different from begat. Begat is talking about someone who was created. Begotten comes from the Greek word monogenes, and it simply means uh, one of a kind, unique from all eternity. So no one else has ever been called in the scriptures begotten one except Jesus Christ. And it doesn't mean he was begotten in the sense that he was created, but that he was from all eternity, and that's what it means in the Greek. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the Word was God, and then became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And dwelt among us, exactly. Get to some calls here. Dr. Jerry Buckner on the program tonight. We are working with, through the issue, the doctrine of the Trinity. And I know there's a lot of confusion on this topic, which is why we've invited Dr. Buckner to join us tonight to talk about the issue and answer your questions. By the way, his new book, Biblical Propositions Supporting the Trinity, available through both his website. I'll give you some information on where you can get it right now. You can go to Amazon.com or get information to Contending for the Faith dot o-r-g triple eight three six seven five three two nine let's lead off first with uh, jerry calling in from sunnyvale and uh, jerry come on in and say hello to dr jerry buckner two jerry's are better than one <laughs> amen hello doc how you doing oh i'm truly blessed and i really like that name <laughs> oh wonderful how can we help you tonight <laughs> is it okay if i introduce a, a question not on the trinity subject well, I'd like to try to stay on topic as best as we can here tonight. I don't want to confuse okay. listeners, uh, Jerry. Um, okay, I can drop off then. Thank you. Okay, thank you anyway. 888 forkfax Let's talk a bit about the whole the issue of monotheism, if you would, for a moment. Some people kind of get stuck on this point because they say, well, Christianity, like Judaism, is a monotheistic religion, and yet we speak of God in three persons. The Trinity. How, how do we maintain the structure of a monotheistic approach to Christianity within the realm of the triune God? Well, that's a good question. Um, the Going back again to the Old Testament, God has uh, revealed himself as one God, but yet God has revealed himself in three eternal distinct persons. I think it's very clear from uh, Genesis 1 and 26 that God said let us you get the Hebrew plural there so even though Deuteronomy 6 and 4 talks about the one God yet in the Old Testament you consistently get the either the plural us or we for instance. Man created in our image. You created in our image and then you have also uh, Genesis 11 and 7 where God says during the, the, the Tower of Babel let us go down and confound their language that they may not understand one one another. And then when you get into Isaiah chapter 6, you see that Isaiah was, the Lord was speaking to Isaiah and says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here am I, Lord, send us. So 
even though the God is revealed as one God, he reveals himself also as three eternal distinct persons. So when we use the word monotheism, we are simply saying one God revealed in three eternal distinct persons. When we use the word polytheism, that's another word that's talking about a multitude of gods, like in Mormonism, they believe in many different gods. Hinduism. In Hinduism, and then even the nation of Islam. I had Dr. Norman Geisler one time when I was doing a lecture, and uh, he came up to me afterwards, and he said, Dr. Buckner, do the black Muslims teach in more, in more than one God? I said, yes, they teach in a multitude of God, and every uh, black male can become a black God. And I said, so they believe in black polytheism, and he kind of got a, a laugh out of that, but it's reality. And then you have another word that's henotheism. You ever heard of that word before? No. Henotheism basically is the teaching that uh, you can uh, draw from many different gods, uh, but you got to pick one main god over those other gods. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> you know? like a competition to me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So we got this uh, serious problem where the devil, when he came into the Garden of Eden, people say that Mormonism w really was the one that started uh, this polytheistic teaching in many gods. No, it started in the Garden of Eden when the enemy came to Eve and said, if you partake of this fruit, you will become as gods, knowing good and evil. So Satan really was the one who uh, instituted this, started it, and people have been following it ever since. Yeah. We're going to take a time out. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Dr. Jerry Buckner. A look tonight at the Trinity, biblical propositions supporting saying the toll-free number to jump in with a comment or a question, 888-367-5329. That's 888-F-O-R-K-F-A-X. When we come back, get back to more of your calls, of course, and then dive through some of the aspects of this, the, the, the notion of the identical essence or nature of God, not merely similar in nature. That is our conversation on the Trinity with Dr. Jerry Buckner continues on this edition of Lifeline. All right, back to our conversation tonight. Dr. Jerry Buckner with us this evening in studio, entertaining your comments and questions tonight on the topic of the Trinity. His new book, Biblical Propositions Supporting the Trinity, details, by the way, on his website at contendingfaith.org. You can also order a copy of the book online through Amazon.com. Let's head over to Palo Alto and say good evening to Lee. Hi, Lee. Come on in with your comment or question for Hi. Dr. Jerry Buckner. Thank you. I know that the triune Godhead is spirit. Um, and in reading the Old Testament, the Father just seems very much like a person to me. I mean, I could um, understand his character and how he thinks. And Jesus, of course, it's, it's easy to see how he thinks because we have his words. But the Holy Spirit, even though Jesus said, um, you know, we pray to the Father through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus said that when he leaves and the Holy Spirit comes, we'll be able to do even much more than, than he did. Um, it, it seems like the, the Holy Spirit becomes a role or a function rather than a person. And I know we can grieve him and quench him, but it seems like, you know, we get boldness from the Holy Spirit. He opens our eyes. But, you know, people, once I asked about the Holy Spirit and someone said, oh, do you speak in tongues? And I do not. So, you know, I mean, it, it just seems like the Holy Spirit is more of a function than a person. All right, good observation. The Old Testament, Dr. Buckner, proclaiming the Father certainly more openly, the Son more obscurely. Of course, in the New Testament, then, manifestation of the Son, suggesting the deity and the presence of the Spirit that now dwells amongst us. So we see kind of three distinct functionaries in terms of the Father in the Old Testament, very strong, the Son in the New, and then the Holy Spirit for the current, you know, for the generation subsequent. Right, exactly. And uh, let me just say this, uh, Lee, this is a good uh, point you're raising. You have to look at the, again, the Trinity being, uh, as I said in the beginning, that you're dealing with one God who's called Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They are distinct persons. Uh, three distinct persons. Let me kind of give you an, uh, an example of this in the New Testament where the Holy Spirit is, is, is a person and he is also God. I'm just going to do this by memory. Uh, John 4 and 24, and you might want to write this down, it says, God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So it makes it clear there that, that the Holy Spirit is, is God. Also, you want to look at uh, 
Acts 5 and verses 3 and 4. You remember Ananias and Sapphira when they lied against the Holy Spirit. Now, you cannot lie against a function. You cannot lie against a win or force. You can only lie against a person or to a person. So we see that Acts 5, 3, and 4, we see that the Holy Spirit was lied to. And then Peter ends up saying, you didn't lie unto man, but you lied unto God. So it's very clear there that the Holy Spirit is not only God, but he's also a person because they lied to a person and he ends up saying, you lied unto God. And then you may want to also look at John chapters 14 through uh, 16, because you have a dialogue between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they're constantly saying, I and we, I send another comforter, and he, and and they constantly uh, interchange he and, and uh, I, and it's constantly letting you know that all three persons are not, ju- they're not a function, they are distinct persons, and they make it very clear in the scripture who they are. So I think you got to look at the totality of scripture. And even though uh, a lot of things in the Old Testament is not as clear, but there are things in the Old Testament that are clear as well. Uh, But in the New Testament, it starts to unfold and you start to get a deeper depth of what the, the Holy Spirit well, is. Let's elaborate on this point for a moment, okay. too, for the benefit of both Lee and, and other listeners. That sometimes we, we kind of get our mind wrapped around this and we're saying, well, now, wait a minute now, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, uh, distinct persons and yet identical in nature. Okay, my mind doesn't understand this. And sometimes with that, we're completely dismissive because I don't get it, it can't possibly be so. And yet if we talk through many concepts of the pillar of faith, Let's talk about the virgin birth. Does anybody know of anyone before or since that was born of a virgin? Absolutely not. Yet we embrace it and accept it. We do that by faith, trying to understand God's very plan of salvation, that this holy, righteous, perfect God would sacrifice his only son on a cross to pay the price that I should have paid for my sins simply because he wants to walk in fellowship with me. There's a level at which I find that a little hard to understand, too. Absolutely. And what we were, I was sharing with you during the commercial is that, and you, you like these words, I share it with you, is that we, uh, there are a lot of things that we cannot comprehend. But there are a lot of things in the scriptures that we can apprehend. Take them in. And we can take them, take them in. And so the scriptures is clear with us when it comes to God. And like you mentioned before, a good point, salvation, is that it tells us in Hebrews 11 and 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. We walk by faith and not by sight. Paul makes it clear in, the, in the, uh, his epistle. So when it comes to basic things in life, not just God, but it, it, when it comes to just everyday matters, you get on a plane, you don't know if it's going to come down. You have faith. When you go to a restaurant, you don't know if somebody can be a terrorist back there cooking your food. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, they could put some poison in your food. Every day you get in the car, you don't know if it's going to explode on you or a bomb has been put in there. Every day we walk by faith. And so God says, be that way towards me as well, because that's what I'm all about. And the mystery of the Godhead at a level, when we're, we're talking about very God himself, it would seem to be a little bit far-fetched at a level for man to expect to fully comprehend the totality of God and his character. I mean, we're, we're living on an entirely different plane. Now, we see through that glass darkly. When we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as it is, as he is on the other side. So it makes perfect sense right now. It makes there are certain perfect levels sense. That, you know, we're, how dare we suggest that we ought to totally, and I'm not referring necessarily to the caller, but just the overall idea that we have to totally comprehend every single aspect of the Godhead before we're willing to accept it, when I think it's perfectly natural to understand that we serve a great mighty and and a God that at certain levels is, is beyond man's capability. It's so true. It's so true. And and several things I want to say about that, because you're making a good point. It tells us in the Isaiah chapter 55, God says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts About higher. Your thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> so don't try to get your thoughts on That's the level right. of God because we're finite and He's infinite. And then the other thing is, it's interesting, Craig, that when you look at life in general, 
you look in the at the creation. There are so many things in creation that reflects God. You know, we see three aspects of an egg, right? And then we see three aspects of water. And then even human beings, God has created us with a body, soul, and spirit. And all of this is a reflection of our creation Mm -hmm. uh, from the creator. God is saying, I put my stamp not only in the universe, but I put my stamp even in man to remind him that there was three distinct persons that created you because we know from uh, Genesis 1 and 1 that God the Father created. We know from John uh, chapter 1 as well as Colossians chapter 1 uh, we know that and also uh, Hebrews chapter 1 that literally Jesus created and then in the Old Testament it talks about the Holy Spirit creating so all three when it says that the Holy Spirit is God he's part of that creative act of mankind so we're all a reflection of God whether we uh, believe it or not Mm-hmm. We'll take a time out, get back to more of your calls, 888-367-5329. That's eight 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 F O R K F A X. 888-F-O-R-K-F-A-X. All right, we're back to the conversation. Dr. Jerry Buckner with us tonight in studio. He, of course, hosts Contending for the Faith, heard Saturday evenings at 7 p.m. right here on KFAX. He is an adjunct professor at Golden Gate Theological Seminary and author of a new book, Biblical Propositions Supporting the Trinity. Show it up here for the camera. And the book available, by the way, at Amazon.com. You can also order it through Dr. Buckner's website, contendingfaith.org, or give him a call at area code 415-721-1778. That's 415-721-1778. We're talking about the doctrine of the Trinity that, as we point out, Dr. Buckner, while not specifically taught in plain language in the New Testament, is yet revealed throughout the entirety of not just the New Testament, but but even prophetically spoken to throughout the Old Testament. With that thought in mind, let's talk about some of the, the notions here. We see God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, all three called God together. Give me a little bit of a deeper understanding in terms of the functionality of each of those distinctive persons within the Godhead. That's a good question. Well, the the Father is the one who always seems to be, because I'm going to back up on that. There is always, God has always worked on a hierarchical level okay. throughout history, not only with uh, himself, but also with the family uh, and with uh, the world in general. So God has established a hierarchical structure by which the Father is the one who literally is the executive head. And then what he does is that he delegates to the Son, and then the Son delegates to the Holy Spirit. And yet it's not one or the other that's inferior to the other. It's just that that's the way they work functionally. They work uh, just like a family, uh, a husband and wife is working uh, for a, a deep end, but yet they are equal, but they have different functions. God has established within the home, the, the head of the woman is the man, and the head of the man is Christ. So God has always worked in a hierarchical structure. And so the Father is the one who is literally the executive head, and then Jesus comes under the head, and then the Holy Spirit comes under that as a a structural, functional order. And God has established that so that we would have order in families, in the church, and in society. And so it's a beautiful uh, setup, and yet we see even though the Father is the head, over Christ, and Christ is the head over mankind, and yet the Father is the head of Christ. The Father and Son are still equal, and even just like in a marriage, the husband is the head of the wife, but yet they're equal ontologically. The Father and Son and Holy Spirit are equal ontologically, but functionally, they are play different roles. And so let me give you another example of this. When Jesus said in John 14 and uh, 28, I believe, he says, the Father is greater than I. He was basically not saying that the Father is greater than he nature-wise, but position-wise. So the Greek word for greater means mazon, and it's talking about position. The Father is in heaven as the executive head. 
came, he allowed the son to come down and die for us, and he took on a lower position, but nature-wise, he's equal. Which you, where you see him then essentially deferring to the Father. Deferring, uh, exactly. Not my will, but thine be done. Thy will be done. And teaching us to depend upon the Father because he did it himself. If you have in the, in the world at one time a perfect man who is God, coming to the earth totally depending upon the father not doing anything upon himself that's a real lesson to us who are imperfect how much we should obey and we see very a high degree of, of functionality between the three uh, aspects of the godhead a, a tremendous sense of interdependence i'll give you an example here in luke 135 speaking of the angel coming to mary concerning the virgin birth of christ and he says the angel answered to her and said the holy spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. So we see all three persons functioning within the matter of coming to Mary to give her the message of how this is all going to take place. Absolutely, and it's good that you mentioned that because within the Trinity, you see all of them working together. Mm -hmm. So that's a good uh, scripture there, uh, Luke 1 and 35. So we see the Trinity together it at the birth of Christ, we see the Trinity together at the baptism of Jesus Christ in, in uh, Matthew 3. Jesus goes comes out of the water, and the Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove, and, a spirit, and the Father says, this is my beloved Son. And you even see the Trinity involved with the resurrection, because not only did Jesus raise himself, John uh, 2, 19 through 21, he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But we also learn that in Galatians 1 and 1, the Father raised raised him up from the dead. And then we learn in Romans 8 and 11 that it says, but if the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit. Fascinating to see the connectivity of those references in every one of the cases. You yes. talked about the baptism, uh, Luke 32, John 1, 32. Here's Stephen. Now here's, here's a wonderful one, Acts 7, 55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God, Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Absolutely. And what I generally do, Craig, that's a good point. What I generally do when I'm teaching this subject, I always say that Trinitarian uh, doctrine, teaching, it always comes like behind a person, first of all, demonstrating the evidence for the Father being and Son and Holy Spirit being one God. I said, don't get into Trinitarian texts first, but you first of all establish that there is one God and that that one God is called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Once you demonstrate that, then you can go to Trinitarian texts. And, and because a lot of Christians have not been taught effectively this subject matter, they'll jump to Trinitarian texts first without demonstrating the validity and historicity and authenticity of the fact that the, there is one God ontologically and that one God is called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we must demonstrate that first. That's why I use in the book the if proposition. If it can be shown that there is one God, if it can be shown that the one God is called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and if it can be shown that they all work together together as one. So we deal with the if propositions, and then we go, after we demonstrate that, we go to the other. And this falls right in place with 1 Peter 3 and 15. God is commanding us, that's an apologetic scripture, to be ready. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks of you, a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. And you know, that comes back full circle as our time and the hour winds down, Dr. Bucker. Too fast. <laughs> we, we oftentimes, I think as believers, struggle with the idea that we're not seeing a strong enough impact of the church on the culture around us today. We wonder why there are so many nominal Christians instead of phenomenal Christians. We, we <laughs> like wonder that. why there's a sense of lukewarmness that seems to permeate a lot of Christendom today. And I think it goes to the heart of this very question that we, we know not in whom we have believed. There is a sense of, of, of cultural Christianity. Well, we were kind of always around this. We accept it. We don't really understand it. We can't explain it. We certainly are incapable of sharing it with others. And so it's difficult for us to be engaged in that process of making disciples because we don't even understand what it means to be a disciple ourselves. And a lot of that goes back to this core central issue of biblical illiteracy. As you've explained the Trinity today, 
we work through just a very basic set of passages in working through those four if propositions, and you very easily and systematically can very clearly see the revelation and substantiation of the Trinity throughout both the Old and the New Testament if we'd only take the time to do the reading. Oh, absolutely. And I'll tell you, you mentioned the word disciple, and I just get uh, goosebumps when I hear you say that. I've been doing a teaching in our church on discipleship and the importance of that. Do you not know that in the Bible, the word disciple is used 270 times, and the word Christian is used three times. Mm -hmm. Now that's serious, because God is really trying to get a point across to us that this is what I want you to grow into, because that involves lordship, it involves rulership, it involves uh, you know stewardship, it involves all of that, and people are not willing to go that far. They don't understand it, therefore they can't share it, and they don't understand it because they haven't understood it because they haven't read it. That's right, absolutely. Bottom line. Yeah, absolutely. We want to invite you to tune in Saturday evenings at 7 p.m. for Contending for the Faith, Dr. Jerry Buckner's program. You can get more information, by the way, on the church and the ministry, contendingfaith.org. That's contendingfaith.org. The new book, Biblical Propositions Supporting the Trinity, available through Amazon.com. You can also get it through Dr. Buckner's website. You can also call for more information, area code 415 221-1778. We invite you to tune in Saturday evenings for Contending for the Faith. Dr. Buckner, as always, great to see you again. Good to see you on the radio, as they say. Amen. We we'll look forward to another visit real soon. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Brother Dr. Craig. Jerry Buckner.